This program is sponsored by The Church of God International and supported by our viewers. There are many religions throughout the world today that teach and believe mankind is inherently immortal. Whether among the Middle Eastern religions or the Asian religions, even including many of the denominations of Christianity, yes, we come to understand they all have one thing in common. They believe human beings have an immortal soul, that humans are born with this immortal soul within them. From early on, the teaching explains this soul is in the personage of every newborn child. And though there is no noticeable effect or proof of this immortality, nonetheless, we are assured it's there. And when we die, it will depart, retaining consciousness and goes on living somewhere for all eternity. But is this what your Bible teaches, that you really don't die, but instead you change life forms into some disembodied spirit and go on living consciously apart from your physical body? Well, interestingly enough, the Bible does indeed teach us immortality is ours to have. But when and how we obtain it is quite surprising. So stay with us as we explore the origin of this teaching about the immortality of the soul. In times like these, we need the armor of God for the well-being of our family to help you stand in the evil day. The Church of God International presents Armor of God, a program of biblical understanding. And now your host, Bill Watson. Well, hello there, and again, welcome to another international telecast of the Armor of God. Good to be with all of you once again. Before I get started, I just wanted to take a moment out to thank all of you for 25 years of telecasting this broadcast for your support. We deeply appreciate it, and on behalf of the team here of the Armor of God, wanted to express our gratitude for your support over that length of time. It's hard to believe 25 years have come and gone, but hey, when you're having fun, uh, time does indeed go fast, but we just wanted to take a moment out to thank all of you for your support. Well, today, like many of our programs, I want to challenge you with a question. And the question is rather important because it deals with you and your life. And oftentimes when we come to face certain circumstances that threaten our lives, this question is a very important question to have answered. And that question is very simply, do you have an immortal soul? Do you have life inherent in you that will go on living apart from your body? In other words, are we immortal? Now, let me say this. If you're answering yes to that question, what you're saying is you don't die. You just continue on living in a different life form apart from your body. And as a result, you just change life forms and continue on in consciousness. Oh yeah, your spirit, you can fly around, you know, uh, you can be invisible to the human eye. Uh, you're, you know, maybe like a hologram, like a ghost, Casper the Friendly Ghost type of thing is the concept that you get in your mind. But the bottom line is, and so many religions believe this, whether you're Hindu, whether you're Buddhist or Muslim, and of course over two billion Christians all believe that when you die, you go to some kind of karma, some kind of paradise, or, or perhaps maybe a place like hell. The Catholics believe it's either hell, heaven, or purgatory. So. But the fact is you're conscious in these new locations in a different life form. Can this be true? Or is this just a lot of Hollywood psychobabble? You know, I have to admit, and it's kind of ironic that we have this little adage, this statement that many of us are used to hearing uh, in and through our lives, whereby when we come in contact with death, 
when we actually come face to face with it, whether it be from an accident or possibly a health issue like a heart attack or a stroke or something that threatens our lives, even a visitation to a funeral, and you see a dead body in a coffin, and you have this statement where you tell a friend in conversation, maybe over a cup of coffee, you know, I had a mortality check this week. Why don't we say, you know what, I had an immortality check this week. I mean, why is it we say a mortality check and not an immortality check? Well, this is what I want to talk a little bit about today, and that is whether or not we do indeed have an immortal soul in us that can live consciously apart outside of our body after our body dies. But before I get into that, I want to interrupt myself as we normally do to present to you a two free offers. Two free offers that you can get, download it right off of our uh, website at cgi.org or you can call the 888 number at 578-8791 and get a hard copy. Uh, it'll take about two or three weeks to get but nevertheless we'll get it out to you. But as I said if you download it right from our website at cgi.org you'll, you'll have it before the program's over. <laughs> and that's far faster and more convenient for all of us if you would go ahead and do that. In addition I want to also mention we have an app that is really a wonderful convenience for those of you who are on the move and would like to maybe download something for your mobile uh, devices, be it your telephone or your iPads. You can buy it at any of the uh, normal app stores you're used to purchasing apps from. But this app will afford you the easy convenience of being able to navigate through our website in such a way that you'll find so many additional pro uh, products for your education, whether they be sermons, whether they be other video products like the Armor of God or Prove All Things, biblical news updates, web chats, all kinds, but even, even YouTube vignettes that we have that are only 10, 15 minutes long that take to task perhaps certain teachings that you might find very interesting and hopefully enhancing to your walk and relationship with Jesus Christ. So don't forget, download it right now maybe or write yourself a note to go ahead and download it when the uh, program is over because you'll find it very, very helpful. In the meantime, get these two free offers and they are immortality, God's gift to the saints. And the other one, do you have an immortal soul? And again, let me remind you, both are free for the asking. All you've got to do is download it at cgi.org or go ahead and dial that 888 number and we'll get it out to you just in a few uh, weeks or so. So, okay, we're setting up this idea of this immortal soul, this subject about whether or not you have essentially a spirit in you that can go ahead and live apart from your body. When your body dies, you're still going to be conscious in a different time zone, a different matrix, a different timeline, in a different life form. And you wonder, you scratch your head and you wonder, well, where did this idea come from? Well, back over here in Genesis chapter 3, I want to draw your attention to an original discussion Eve had with a being a nakish in the Hebrew. The word is nakish and it means whispering spirit and more so than a serpent. But nevertheless, the discussion proceeded and, and ensued about this nakish taking God to task over what he had told Eve with respect to not eating from a particular tree in the midst of a garden. And God warned Eve that if she did, she would die. And the Nakish went ahead and he took that to task because he said uh, here in verse 4, well, the serpent said unto her, Woman, look, though God said that, you shall not surely die. The actual fact is God knows that if you do eat of it, you're going to be like him. You're going to know good from bad, evil from right, and you're going to be like God. And the rest is history. I think many of us know that man from that point on has thought in many of the religions that have emerged over the history of humankind that when he dies, he doesn't die. He just goes on living because he's got immortality contained within him and he's apart now from the flesh living in a different matrix consciously apart from his body. And furthermore, 
other scriptures similar to this one, and there's a few others, but over here in Job, chapter 32, just let me illustrate to you how some people misinterpret particular scriptures. They read into it. And here in chapter 32, and I think it is in verse 8, we read this very quickly. But there is a spirit in man. Okay, that's what we read here in verse 8 of chapter 32 of the book of Job. And the inspiration of the Almighty gives them understanding. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, we find that the question is presented by the writer Solomon there, King Solomon, a very wise guy, that said essentially from the standpoint of who knows where the spirit in man goes after the body dies. He reemphasizes this mysterious kind of, um, you know, ambiguous statement in chapter 12, verse about 7 or so, and reiterates the fact that no one really knows where this spirit, this ruach in the Hebrew, and ruach simply means breath. It means air. It means rational being and functions associated with the rational being. And so it is easy to read into the fact that you have what you could say people saying, well, that means we're immortal. But no, the word immortal spirit as it pertains to mankind in your Bible is nowhere to be found. You can search from Genesis to Revelation. You will not find a combination immortal soul pertaining to humankind of any sort. So my question is, where did this idea of an immortal soul come from? Well, as I pointed out in Genesis 3, I guess we could say very easily it came from Satan, the devil himself. And since then, man has believed that fact in one form or another, one fashion or another, whether you're Hindu or whether you're Christian, whether you're Buddhist or whether you're Muslim. All religions today, in most cases, have this idea that you have an immortal soul and that you'll go on living after death. But it did get reinforced, and before we answer what the Bible actually teaches, let me give you a little bit of a backdrop on where and how this teaching became reinforced, how it was promoted, and how it advanced and infiltrated, infiltrated into the Christian teachings, into the Christian doctrine, into the Christian church, because it did infiltrate in that respect, my friends. And how it did? Well, it infiltrated through the Gnostics and, and also through many of the Hellenistic teachings of that time. And you wonder, well, where did that come from? Well, where that came from were many of the philosophers that preceded those movements in the early first century when the early New Testament church was going on. It was guys like Socrates who taught Plato, who taught Aristotle. And these fellows advanced this idea back before the Gnostics, even back before the Hellenist movement got legs and advanced the idea that you have an immortal soul in you. Where did they get it from? Well, they got it from Egypt. They got it from the Babylonian mysteries. As a matter of fact, over here, uh, I've got a little quotation here with respect to um, the uh, philosopher, the philosopher Socrates, and he said essentially in this particular case that he was taught by the Egyptians the Orphic Babylonian mysteries. And Plato was taught by him. He was a student of Socrates. And he picked up on this, wrote something in his book called Phaedo. And I want to quote that real quickly here for all of you. Listen to this. And I'm quoting, The soul, whose inseparable attribute is life, will never admit of life's opposite, death. Thus, the soul is shown to be immortal. And since immortal, indestructible. Do we believe there is such a thing as death? To be sure. And is this anything but the separation of the soul and the body? And being dead is the attainment of this separation when the soul exists in herself and separates from the body and the body is parted from the soul. That is death. Death is merely the separation of the soul and the body. 
And so Plato advances this concept. He advances it to Aristotle, and, and so many of the then church fathers began to adopt it. Origen, Tertullian, Aquinas, or Aquinas. I mean, all of these guys, these early writers of the uh, pre Nicene fathers, as we would call them, uh, who adopted much of these teachings, and finally, through the Gnostic movement and the influence of much of the, of the uh, Hellenist movement, it became infiltrated. Notice what Justin uh, said in this uh, particular case. He says, um, But our Jesus Christ, being crucified and dead, and having ascended to heaven, reigned. And by those things which were published in His name among all nations by the apostles, there is joy offered to those who expect the immortality promised by Him. Origen said, souls are immortal, as God Himself is eternal and immortal. Tertullian, he said this, for some things are known, even by nature, the immortality of the soul, for instance, is held by many. I may use, therefore, the opinion of Plato. I find that funny. He doesn't use the opinion of Paul or of Isaiah or of, uh, you know, Zechariah or Jeremiah. No, no. He uses the opinion of Plato. And he says, and I go back quoting, when he declares, and I'm quoting now, when he declares every soul is immortal. So you have these ideas coming from all of these philosophers who influenced the Gnostic movement and influenced the Hellenistic movement and was adopted by many of the Jewish folk at that time who were par, uh, primarily the, the participants of the early New Testament church because everybody understands and knows, if you know anything about the Christian movement, that in the beginning many and most of those that adhered to the Christian movement were out of the Jewish background or out of the Hebrew background. They were out of the Old Testament covenant, and that's how they viewed the New Testament writings and so forth. They were an outgrowth of that. As a matter of fact, that's why Christianity oftentimes was labeled an outgrowth of Hebrewism, because essentially Hebrews made up most of the population of the early new church. So as time continues on here on this program, I'm going to cut to the chase. The question is, through all of this influence that we see the church had with the Hellenist movement advancing this idea that started with uh, Socrates and was pushed down through the ages and the early hundreds of years before that movement and before even Christ was incarnate, the fact is, is that in knowing how and where some of this information came from, the question is, what does the Bible then teach by comparison? Well, turn with me over here to the book of Ezekiel in chapter 18. In the book of Ezekiel, and in chapter 18, I just want to read to you here uh, a few scriptures that basically tell uh, <laughs> a, a real a uh, big challenge for all of us who believe in this idea that you have an immortal soul. Because the fact remains is that if indeed you do, how can the prophet Ezekiel say here in verse 4 of chapter 18, uh, he says, Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, he says here, so also the soul of of the Son is mine. The soul that sins, it shall die. You get that? It shall die. In verse 20, same chapter, verse 20, we read here uh, very clearly, the uh, prophet says this, the soul that sins, and again he reemphasizes, it shall die. So here we're told that this soul can die. And what is the Hebrew word here used for soul? Nephish. Go with me real quickly here. Time is moving on me. But go over here to Genesis chapter 2, and in um, verse 7, we read real quickly here an interesting point that man, in verse 7 uh, here, we read, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul, not an immortal soul, a living soul. And again, the word 
nephish, a living nephish. Now over here in verse 19, same chapter, I want to bring you over where Adam is actually naming all the animals. And it says here, out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl uh, of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, nephish. You see the translation? Creature. You could go back to verse 7 very easily, insert the word creature, and say that man became a living creature. What does the word nephish mean? What does the word nephish mean? It means simply air-breathing creature. It has nothing to do with immortality. It has nothing to do with you living all, uh, forever, eternally, outside of your body. No, no, no. It has everything to do with you being an air-breathing creature creature. That's right, my friends. And so here in Genesis, we find a very interesting realization about the fact of how man is indeed characterized. And man is characterized as an air-breathing mammal. That's basically what he is. And over animals, over a dog and a cat, flesh to flesh, there is really no preeminence, as pointed out in the book of Ecclesiastes. We see that. We understand that. There's no no misunderstanding. It's very clear uh, with regards to these particular writings. Now, over here in Job, again, let's go back to the book of Job because Job has some interesting statements made with regard to an age-old question on whether or not man will indeed live again. And over here in Job chapter uh, 14, we read this very interesting talk and discussion with regard to uh, Job's challenge. And in verse 10 he says this, um, But man dies and wastes away. Yes, man gives up the breath, the ghost. And where is he? As the water falls from the sea and the flood decays and dries up, so man lies down and rises not till the heavens be no more. They shall not awake, not be raised out of their sleep. Notice that word sleep. He's talking about dead people. And he says here in verse 13, Oh, that you wouldest hide me in the grave, that you would keep the secret until your wrath be past, that you would appoint me a set time and remember me. If a man dies, shall he live all the days of his appointed time? I wait for that change. Wow. So here we see Job is basically looking at a time for change. That's right, my friends. He's looking for a time for change. And over here in 1 Corinthians, I want to take you over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 for a moment just to illustrate to you a mystery that the Apostle Paul brings to our minds with regard to a comparison of mortality versus immortality. Notice this in verse 51. He re, uh, we read here in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, chapter 51, it says, Behold, I'm going to show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. There's that word again, sleep, that Job used back there in chapter 14. He says here, but we shall be changed. And that's what Job said. All the days of his life he waits for that change to come. Okay, so we're on the same page here with the Apostle Paul and the ancient patriarch Job who lived thousands of years before Paul did. He says here in verse 52, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trump shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Did you notice that? Look at this. Paul says it again, in case you didn't catch it the first time. Verse 14, uh, I'm sorry, 54, verse 54. So when the corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and the mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O grave. 
Where is your victory? So here you have it, my friends. The Bible is clearly teaching you. You're not immortal. You're mortal. And that there's a time of change that's going to come. In this very chapter earlier, Paul talks about the fact that Christ is the first of the first fruits. They're about verse 20 something or so. And those that are Christ's shall come back to life, shall be changed to immortality after his return. After his return, not before. That means basically that when you die, you do not go to heaven. You go to the grave. That's why in John chapter 5, you can read it there, that you'll, you will be called out of the grave by Jesus Christ upon His return. And all those in the grave shall rise and meet the Lord in the air. The dead in Christ shall rise first, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And those that are alive, as pointed out right here in 1 Corinthians 15, shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye and converted, materially converted from mortal flesh and blood to immortal spirit to live eternally in the kingdom of God that's coming to earth. And that's another story in itself. Well, time's run out on me, my friends. Go ahead right now, ask for both of those offers that we offered before. Both are free. Immortality, God's gift to the saints. And do you have an immortal soul? Both are free for the asking. All you've got to do is dial that 888 number, uh, uh, 578 87 91 or get us on that uh, website and download it right off that website at cgi.org. You can go ahead and get it, as I say, even uh, before the program ends here. It's far more convenient for you to do that and for us as well, and you'll get it much, much faster. So go ahead. Go ahead now and request both of those offers that I've said. Uh, basically, immortality, God's gift to the saints, and do you have an immortal soul? Both, again, let me emphasize, are free. This is Bill Watson, and as we always do, my friends, we remind you to always keep on that armor of God, especially in this day of evil that we find ourselves surrounded by. Armor of God and the free material offered is brought to you by the Church of God International of Tyler, Texas. You may write to us at 3900 Thames Street, Tyler, Texas, 75701, or call toll-free at 1-888-578-8791, or call one 939 2929 during regular business hours. You may visit our website at www.cgi.org or email us at armorofgodcgi.org. We appreciate your prayers and support. This program is sponsored by The Church of God International and supported by our viewers.